It's the backbone of modern life. It's in the food we eat, the houses we live in, and the cars we drive. One of the most important commodities in the world, oil. But what if it all suddenly disappeared? Martial law has been declared to deal with the emergency. Food shipments are being delivered to New York. Hundreds of thousands are on the move. They say the cities are growing too dangerous. What might happen to our cities, our food, our very way of life? Today, our worst nightmare begins. Today, the world runs out of oil. Oil. For 150 years, we've been extracting it from the ground. It's the easy economical fuel that makes the modern world possible. California, the Kern River oil field a black underground pool that contains more than half a billion barrels of oil, enough to fuel America for four weeks. One minute from now, it's all going to disappear. Around the world, the same thing will happen. From Saudi Arabia to the North Sea to the massive tar sands of Alberta, Canada, all the oil that drives our cars, flies our planes, powers our factories, even the oil below the ground is about to vanish. Deep underground, the first ominous signal appears. There's something going on. I gotta go. Yeah, come on. We've already taken more than a trillion barrels of oil from the earth. Still nothing. Another trillion should be left. What's going on? I have no idea what's going on. Yesterday, this refinery processed 300,000 barrels of oil. But today, there's nothing. It's a crisis some predicted. Now, it's reality. And the world must react. accessible untapped oil but scientists are now confirming that it's all gone around the world from saudi arabia to alaska the oil below the ground has disappeared oil companies say as much as 20 million barrels is left at their refineries but companies say it's not just our supply of gas but diesel fuel lubricants asphalt tar all of the products that are made from oil will be severely affected if we can't find more oil Thousands of tankers carrying millions of barrels of oil are on the move. But exporting countries like Russia and Saudi Arabia now order the boats back home. To the U.S., it's a huge blow. It imports more oil than any other country in the world. Every day, the U.S. produces over 8 million barrels of oil, but it consumes more than twice that amount. Now, we're 8 million barrels short and growing. There are reports of long lines at gas stations as people try to stock up. Expect two to three hour delays. Americans race to fill up their cars. 
maybe for the last time. In 1973, the oil embargo caused some American stations to run out of gas. But this situation is far worse. Over 100,000 gas stations across the country are being pumped dry. And it's happening all over the world. Gas prices skyrocket out of control. Many countries have oil in reserve. The U.S. has 725 million barrels of crude oil hidden away. To protect what little is left, the government takes dramatic steps. Planes, trains, boats, all but the most vital transportation is shut down. Roads are quiet. Tracks are empty. Flights are grounded. The four million people flying today are now stranded. And so are hundreds of thousands of tons of cargo. Airports are chaotic. The economic fallout is swift. Panic forces the government to halt stock trading, just like after 9-11. Two trillion dollars of oil stock is now worthless. More than 400,000 people working in the U.S. oil industry are suddenly out of a job. Going up to Mexico. Sure. All right. They try to get home. All right, let's move. Any way they can. Facing uncertainty about the future, thousands of manufacturing plants close immediately. Millions more lose their jobs. Oil is one of the most powerful, versatile fuels on the planet. It's made from dead plants and animals that are compressed and heated over hundreds of millions of years. It's in everything from toothpaste to lipstick polyester to plastics. Now, it's all gone. An enormous chain reaction has been set in motion. What's your name? I need a bed in here, stat. Let's get him on the Crippling every part of our lives. Okay, our hospitals, now, okay? our food, our power and the crisis is just beginning. Martial law has been declared. The National Guard is now patrolling downtown Washington and Los Angeles. EU leaders in Strasbourg are sending 100 million barrels of oil to England. Stock markets from Tokyo to New York remain closed. Unemployment is over 30%. It's been just five days since the world ran out of oil. And the most basic human needs are suddenly out of reach. Food terminals across North America are closed. In California, 
Each day, 1,300 trucks used to leave the state carrying fresh fruits and vegetables to deliver to grocery store shelves across the country. Now, the trucks sit idle and groceries aren't being delivered. New York and other big cities are hit hardest. It takes on average about one football field of farmland to raise enough food for just one person for one year. Without oil fuel transportation, it's nearly impossible to feed a city of millions. A quick trip to the grocery now takes hours. Armed guards are posted at every store. Before the crisis, 30% of fresh fruits and vegetables didn't make it onto shelves because of small imperfections. Now, everything is up for grabs. Almost a quarter of our produce comes from other countries. But that won't last. Food is disappearing quickly. Farms have too many mouths to feed. An adult cow eats 100 pounds of feed a day. A pig needs eight pounds. In an ironic twist, animals once raised for food are now facing starvation. The fragile power system is falling into darkness. Forty percent of the world's electricity comes from coal-burning power plants. This plant in England burns coal that comes from as far away as the U.S. All of it arrives here by train. Each car carries enough coal to power a small town for a day. But without oil, the trains are no longer running. Blackouts spread across North America. Florida is hit hard. It relies heavily on electricity generated directly from burning oil. Its big city hospitals are equipped with emergency backup generators, but even they run on diesel fuel. A Miami hospital is on its last tank of diesel. There's only enough to last eight more hours. In San Francisco, law and order is breaking down. Under the cover of darkness, looters begin their work. People are desperate. And they're not just looking for food. Diesel engines can run on cooking oil, new or used. This is what we need. An average car needs around 10 gallons of gas to travel 300 miles. Diesel engines are 30% more efficient. As long as there's enough cooking oil to go around, this truck and any other diesel-powered vehicle can stay on the road. OK, they are almost. and rail lines, 
Rationing of fuel for emergency food shipments will begin soon in the hardest hit areas. The White House is warning that the oil reserves are down to just 500 million barrels. Experts predict that the United States may run out by the end of the year. It's now 30 days since the world's oil disappeared. Governments around the globe take drastic action. They keep only the most crucial services up and running. Emergency oil reserves are converted into diesel fuel for cargo trains. These trains deliver coal to power plants to keep electricity on. Some basic electrical services are restored in countries around the world. In North America, electricity is now delivered through a system of isolated power grids. It can no longer be sent from grid to grid. In Florida, where much of the state's power comes directly from oil, blackouts are still widespread. Emergency fuel gets passenger trains rolling again. But now, they're carrying food, not people. Transporting food is rapidly draining the world's emergency reserves. The U.S. only has enough oil to last another 11 months. Cars that once defined the country are in danger of becoming obsolete. There are over 235 million cars that run on gasoline in America. Imagine pushing your car for 20 miles. That's the power from just one gallon of gasoline. America needs cars. It's literally built to serve them. Half of the U.S. lives in the suburbs. Before the oil crisis, most of what we consumed was delivered to us. Now, we must kiss that easy life goodbye. Americans are desperate for an alternative. In the Midwest, 400,000 farmers plant a new crop. These fields once grew different fruits and vegetables. Now, there's only soybeans. Oil can be extracted from soybeans and turned into diesel fuel. And there are other options. 150 million acres of land is now devoted to growing corn for ethanol, a fuel alternative for gas-powered cars. In Brazil, cars are still on the road, even without oil. Here, cars and trucks are running on ethanol made from sugarcane. North America is decades behind. But there's still hope that the end of oil may not be the end of the line. Thousands of electric cars are on the streets. On a planet without oil, they could point the way to a new future. But another, more immediate challenge is on the horizon. A dark and dangerous winter. has announced that the big three automakers have been taken over by Washington. They'll concentrate on making electric trucks to supplement food deliveries along with diesel. The Department of Agriculture has announced an aggressive plan to plant sugarcane throughout Florida, Louisiana, and Hawaii this winter to speed up ethanol production. Food shipments from area farms to New York, Philadelphia, and Boston have been further reduced to every other day. 
It's now five months since the world ran out of oil. In big cities throughout the U.S., food terminals are closed. Hungry people don't have enough to eat. Long lines form at train stations awaiting food shipments. Powdered milk and rice take the place of fresh produce. Coal deliveries, fire trucks, and other essential services are still receiving fuel from emergency reserves for now. But nearly everything else is at a standstill. To stretch the final reserve barrels as long as possible, the U.S. dramatically reduces its oil consumption. Even so, in a few months, there won't be enough oil for any food deliveries at all. While food is still being brought in, garbage isn't being taken away. Every year, it takes nearly 6,000 trucks burning 20 million gallons of diesel to get rid of New York's trash. In this new world, garbage cleanup is a luxury. Even with blackouts, growing hunger, and a looming winter, North America is doing better than most. Six thousand miles away, an economic disaster is unfolding. Ninety percent of Saudi Arabia's income from exports used to come from oil. Now, the country's economy is collapsing. One of the dwindling food shipments is heading to Japan. The country used to import 60% of its nutritional needs. Now the population of one of the world's most prosperous countries is beginning to starve. Back in the US, people are getting desperate and they aren't waiting on the government for answers. Garages and basements are now makeshift laboratories. I'm ready for next one? Where everyday citizens combine methanol, lye, and other scavenged chemicals to make homemade biofuel. Rick. It's a dangerous gamble, but if it pays off, it could fuel an escape out of the city. All right, I need the final. But this do-it-yourself solution only works on diesel cars, and only for a little while. All right, yeah, here we go. I'm ready, brother? You did it, you did it, brother, yes! Woo! You're the best, you're the best. Other fuel alternatives are also facing serious hurdles. After a massive emergency planting, the soybean harvest in North America is now twice as big as the previous year. It's producing more than half a billion gallons of biodiesel. But that's still less than 1% of the diesel North America used each year before oil disappeared and there won't be any more shipments until the next harvest. More and more corn is being planted to produce ethanol. 
but governments around the world face a brutal choice. Should next year's crop be used for fuel or food? In a world without oil, hospitals are running out of critical supplies. Rubber gloves, drugs, lubricants, plastic gowns, they're all made from oil. Without them, drug-resistant infections are spreading quickly. In big cities, some families are managing to survive. But things are taking a turn for the worse. Electrical transformer fires that used to be a minor nuisance now spell major disaster. Abandoned cars block emergency ambulances. And to make matters worse, winter's coming. Put in all your winters. For millions, it's time to make a decision. Hunker down in a crowded, dangerous city or get out. The exodus continues. Across America, people are fleeing the cities. It's being called an emergency government transport. By foot, by sled, however they can, they're getting out. As the temperature plummets, hundreds of thousands of people are leaving. New York, Chicago, Detroit. They're heading throughout Europe. The destinations are Spain, Greece, and southern France. All are being overwhelmed by desperate immigrants trying to escape numbing cold. The refugees leave behind millions of cars. Even vehicles running on cooking oil are abandoned. Now that it's cold, their oil is thick and sludgy. It clogs the fuel lines and engines, making them useless. No people, no fuel, no food. Northern cities become quiet islands of concrete and glass, surrounded by ice and snow. Most people head south, but some flee further north. Two cans of slices. They stockpile non-perishable food to get them through the cold weather. But they're limited to what little they could carry. They resort to hunting and trapping food to survive. An adult male needs about 210,000 calories to get through the winter. And this winter is going to be a long one. It's a famine worse than the mid-1980s when a million died. 
Experts believe the death toll could reach 20 million. The government has announced the emergency oil reserves have fallen to less than 250 million barrels. Two of the four installations are... It's one year since the end of oil. The U.S. is increasingly isolated. West Coast ports that used to move nearly two million tons of material a day are now eerily silent. From Russia to Japan, ports are closed. Docks are empty. International trade is virtually over. Brand new cars will never be driven. The world's military is defenseless against the oil crisis. The US Department of Defense used to spend nearly $180 billion a year on oil, making it the country's single largest consumer of fuel. Now, its tanks and planes sit empty. They're simply too expensive to run. Emergency vehicles take priority. They now use simple conversion systems to run on ethanol to keep life-saving services up and running. Plants grow slowly, and the demand for fuel grows quicker by the day. It's leading to tough decisions. The U.S. has turned a record 40% of its corn crop into ethanol. But more corn in the gas tank means less corn at the kitchen table. and the nation is hungry. And ethanol isn't making much of a dent. Not everyone's back on the road. Fewer cars are a blessing for some. Before, hundreds of millions of animals were killed on highways. Now, populations of moose, deer, even frogs explode. But farm animals aren't so lucky. Farms no longer get deliveries of feed. Farmyards are abandoned. Hundreds of millions of cows, pigs, and chickens die. The hands of time seem to slowly move backwards. As factory farms collapse, many people return to a simpler way of life. They're left with no choice but to eat what they can grow. Global food production is now increasingly local. Farms spring up in empty city lots. In suburbs, families plant whatever they can. A Category 5 hurricane has devastated Miami. Thousands are feared dead. When Katrina smashed into New Orleans in 2005, the cleanup continued for years. But in Miami, there's no fuel to rebuild. Without oil, there's no bouncing back from disaster. The influenza outbreak continues to rip through America. Los Angeles, Miami, Houston, all are still struggling. Quarantine zones are being created. The Center for Disease Control say the death toll may be as high as 200,000. I think this is good. Cool. It's Caleb. Come on. Hospitals are in high demand, but nearly impossible to reach. 
money in. Some people have saved gasoline for an emergency trip like this. But there's a bump in the road. Hoarding gasoline doesn't work. The chemicals that once kept it fresh now degrade the gasoline. After a year, this fuel goes bad. What's going on? <laughs> Run. A world that was once so closely connected is falling apart. The price of lithium, needed for thousands of electric batteries, has soared again, as much as 300%. The abdication of the Saudi royal family is a shock. Immigration unrest in Spain and Portugal. New York has declared a state of emergency to deal with a chronic food. It's a migration that's never been. It's been 10 years since the world's supply of oil disappeared. Even out in space, things are changing. The oil that once sent rockets into orbit is too precious to waste. Almost 200 satellites, the backbone of our international communication systems, are becoming space junk. But back on Earth, one person's trash is another person's treasure. In a world without oil, discarded electronics are now a valuable commodity. Hey, Dad, look what I found. Hey, look, look, cell phone. A ton of used cell phones contains almost 10 ounces of gold, nearly 300 pounds of copper, and over six pounds of silver, vital materials in a world where trade has stopped. Hey, Dad, I think there's some gold in that. Oh, yeah. And it's not just electronics. Plastic takes hundreds of years to disappear. Bottles and containers once carelessly tossed out, are being recovered and reused. People are recycling in ways small and large. Container vessels are being harvested. 90% of a ship can be recycled, mostly for steel, a cheap raw material for building. But not all ships are being torn apart. Hundreds of boats are running on biodiesel. This ship is carrying the first delivery of lithium to North America. The lithium comes from Bolivia, where it's mined from the country's salt flats by the ton. Lithium is the main ingredient in the most efficient electric batteries, and the world is hungry for electric alternatives. Bolivia's industry is booming. On a planet without oil, Bolivia is a superpower, the Saudi Arabia of the New World Order. But there still isn't enough biofuel to completely restore world trade. But there's hope in algae. Algae can be processed into oil and produce 30 times more energy per acre than other biofuels. It's completely renewable and requires very little fertilizer. 10 years after oil, 10 billion gallons of biofuel made from algae are in use. But that's still not enough biofuel to get us back in the air. 
commercial flying for cargo and for passengers is still way too expensive. 34 million passengers used to come through this airport every year. Now, it's silent. Other transportation is filling the void left behind. Nearly two million cargo trucks are back on the road. They bring hospitals, vital supplies, like gloves, syringes, and tubing, now made from natural gas. City hospitals are clean and safe and ready to serve again. Back home, the modern house has gone through a revolution. But the human toll has been great. Communities are fractured. Families have lost loved ones. Experts warn that the levels of natural gas are dropping, and there are also warnings that we're rapidly consuming the global coal reserves. The coal That's better. Yeah. The world is struggling to find a new balance, and it could take decades. Hostilities continue as China expands its lithium exploration across the Tibetan border. Estimates are that as much as 400,000 tons... Annual census shows that L.A. continues to be the country's largest city, with some 20 million people in Los Angeles. It's the first flight of a jet entirely powered by biodiesel. The company says it's planning six transatlantic flights a year. It's been 40 years since the world's supply of oil disappeared. The skies are noticeably cleaner. No more oil-based jet fuel. No more car exhaust. No more factory pollution. In Canada, the U.S., and Mexico alone, three and a half billion tons of toxic pollutants have vanished every year since the global oil supply ran dry. In North America, people are venturing back into northern cities. They're transforming the ruined roads and buildings. Abandoned apartments become greenhouses. People are farming in downtown New York. Parking lots and buildings are reclaimed and seeds planted. New York City's Central Park is now a massive 800-acre farm that helps feed returning residents. The days of mass food delivery to the suburbs are over. Stores are abandoned and forgotten. Gasoline is completely gone. The emergency oil reserves are empty. There are a few cars left on the road, but they're much different than before. Average cars used to weigh 4,000 pounds. New vehicles are much lighter. Their bodies are no longer made from metal. They're made from lighter materials like carbon fiber instead. And they're powered by electricity. But these cars are pricey and the lithium to power their batteries is still in short supply. Large fleets of container ships and trucks are moving again.
thanks to algae biofuel. In North America, huge new bioreactors are converting 10 million acres of algae into all the fuel the country needs. After it's processed, it's pumped through the very pipelines once used to move oil around the world. Electricity is driving transportation. Electric trains are linking people around the planet. Like in the 19th century, cities are once again growing up along rail lines. Other cities are abandoned. Oil fueled an enormous boom around the world. In just 150 years, it allowed the world's population to double, then triple. Food production exploded. World trade expanded. It was a wild ride, but someday it had to end. Without oil, our cities, our skies, our roads are nearly unrecognizable. Now, society has a second chance to reimagine itself after oil. Can renewables power our future? The UK gets its energy from five main sources. But we can't keep using fossil fuels without risking dangerously overheating the Earth. Nuclear power could supply all our energy, but has some disadvantages. So could renewables supply our energy in the future? Today, we get 7% of our energy from a range of renewable sources. Renewables are naturally replenished, and two of them could each supply all our energy on their own solar and wind. Solar power harnesses energy from the sun. Covering around 4% of the UK in solar panels would produce all the energy we need. But that's the same land area as roughly six Londons. Wind turbines harness energy from wind. Covering around 5% of the UK's land and sea with wind turbines would generate all the energy we need. But that's the same as about eight Londons. Solar energy and wind are natural resources that won't run out. But we can't get energy this way when the wind isn't blowing and the day turns to night. Other renewable sources could provide some of our energy. For example, we could burn plant material. If we used roughly double the total UK land area, we could grow enough plant material to produce all our energy in this way. But there would be nowhere for us to live and produce our food. These are just some of the renewable options we could use to help power the UK in the future. In practice, we'll need a mixture of energy sources. The question for us all is how much of each?